So I'm going to get started. Uh, love once again, thank you for Norris Medical, uh, Medical, and thanks for everyone here for being with us. Uh, so I uh, spend a lot of my time in my practice uh, doing the zygomat- a lot of zygomatic implants. Obviously, uh, dental implants are something that are uh, you know booming in, in dentistry, and I've devoted a lot of my time to reconstruction of the severely resorbed maxillus. And a lot of my patients come in with um, failed uh, all on force. Here you can see the, uh, the pictures from one of the courses we did in my office uh, where we had some participants come in and, uh, you know, obviously they observed me doing a live surgery. I was placing some Norris zygomatic implants. Um, hopefully in the future, we're going to have live courses in uh, the office because in Arizona, we can get a, a, a one week hardship license for anyone uh, to work on patients as long as they have an active license somewhere in the States, but that's down the road. So let me, without further ado, get started here. Uh, let's see if I can advance my slide. There we go. So this is what I used to do in the past. Um, you see a, a patient here that I did a sandwich osteotomy. We took a piece of their hip, um, shaped it like a horseshoe, and, and basically we anchored that into the maxilla that was very atrophic with dental implants. Well, a lot of times we put undue pressure on there. The patients would have resorption. And nonetheless, sometimes these work, sometimes the implants uh, would be left with very little bone down the road. So it was not the greatest and the best uh, restoration or surgical option for patients. Now, of course, you can see on the right of that, there's patients that have uh, double zygomas with a couple of anterior implants if they have adequate bone anteriorly. And of course, on the bottom, you see the quad zygoma, which has been around for quite some time. And we're gonna spend some time on that today um, to talk about these options. So where did all these angled implants come from? Obviously, the first one was pterygoid implants that was developed by Dr. Paul Tessier, and they've been, been very successful, but that's been uh, talked about uh, during many Norris seminars, and I encourage you uh, to, to go look at them. There's some great lectures that some of my co-presenters have done, um, and uh, pterygoid implants have been talked about quite a bit, and I think there's one tomorrow, too. Then there's, of course, the long zygomatic implants, first developed by Dr. Granemark, who was an orthopedic surgeon. And like I said, um, these were initially designed for reconstruction of head and neck cancer defects, and now we use them for um, dental uh, rehabilitation of the dental crippled patients, as I call them. These are patients that have nowhere else to go other than massive uh, bony reconstruction, but that's a, that's a big surgery itself. And of course, the tilted implants, the so-called all on four, all on six, whatever you want to call it, uh, and that has been more and more uh, common amongst our uh, dental colleagues worldwide. And like I said, there's lots of patients that do uh, tilted implants all on force. Sometimes these cases do very well. And unfortunately, there are some patients that develop failures. And as a result, in the maxilla, there's not much of a choice other than doing zygomatic implants sometimes. So when do we do zygomatic implants and when do we do an all on four? So zygomatic implants are basically indicated in an edentulous maxilla in a patient that does not want bone grafting and major reconstruction, where there's only bone in zone one, or as I call it, the premaxilla. So here, if you look in the middle of the screen, the premaxilla is this area here. If you only have bone in zone one, you're not going to be able to do an all-on four. You're looking at an all-on two. So if there's no bone in zone two or three, or there's only bone on one side, then you're looking at a um, patient that has only alveolar bone anteriorly. So you're going to have to do zygomatic implants on this patient. Um, or you're going to have to do sinus lifting on these patients and do conventional implants if they don't want to undergo zygomatic implants, but that's a long, lengthy process. So keep in mind this slide as I'm going to show it again later. So if you're missing those bone in zone two and three, you're looking at the option of zygomatic implants. Now, there are some patients that are deficient even in zone one. And basically, their, na- their nasal floor is co- coincident with their oral mucosa. In those cases, you don't have a choice but doing the quad zygoma. There is no other option. So uh, going back to the zygomatic implants, Dr. Brandenmark first um, uh, you know, did cases with these back in the, um, the uh, 80s and 90s. And of course, throughout um, uh, the year 2000, there's been many, many studies, and they've basically shown a 95% success rate over time. And some of them fail early on, sometimes that surgical technique, sometimes there's complications that develop. In my own hands, um, I, you know, I must say, 
I've had one to two failures a year. And uh, when I go back and look at them, you can always find out what caused the failure. Sometimes it's a patient, sometimes it's restorative failure, and sometimes it's surgical failure. But nonetheless, when these implants are done properly, the failure rate is very, very low. The success rate is just as good as conventional dental implants. So what are they, uh, when are they indicated? So here is a typical patient that I would see in my practice, someone that has severe atrophy of their maxillary complex. And you can see the floor of the nose is almost coincident with the oral cavity. Now, some people are doing them for patients with moderate atrophy. Like I said, this patient only has bone in zone one, quite deficient in zone two and three. Um, you could probably try to get away with an all on four, but nonetheless, the success rate for the zygomatic implant is just as good, if not better. And no atrophy. Some people are using zygomatic implants in combination with pterygoid implants for patients that are deficient um, in just, um, you know, the width, height a little bit, but they can use a quasi-goma or zygomatic implants with pterygoids and anteriorly with the, in the vomer region to do uh, zygomatic implants. So there are a whole host of indications. Now, the newest and, and uh, you know, technology is available to us. And what we found uh, through lots of research and trial and error is that um, maybe the success rate for zygomatic implants can be even better through an extra maxillary technique because the traditional technique was the intramaxillary technique, as you can see on the left. And uh, now with the extra maxillary technique, uh, we have found that the implants have a better success rate and the surgery is quite um, more, uh, I would say it's easier. It's not as cumbersome. So I have, uh, in, my, in my first 10 to 15 years of doing these, I did mostly almost all intramaxillary or intrasinus. And now I've gravitated towards the extramaxillary technique for a number of reasons. I find that the restoration um, is in a more, um, uh, I would say, appealing or uh, position for the patients. There's not as pal much palatal bulk to it for patients. And of course, the uh, head of the implants comes out in a more uh, favorable buccal position on the alveolar crest if it's done correctly. But in order to, uh, to basically understand the difference, we're going to go through some cases. And like I said, I encourage you to go back and watch some of the webinars that uh, my other co-presenters for Norris Medical have done. These are all available on YouTube, so I'm not, uh, I would not, I'm not going to belabor some of the points that they have gone over in the interest of time, but there are indications for each one. And sometimes when I do a case, I do a combination of one implant in the intramaxillary position and one in the extramaxillary position. Um, you know, some people, based on the Zaga classification, they let the anatomy of the zygoma dictate where they place the implants. But of course, the anatomy of the sinus is just as important. Some patients will come with a very large pneumatized maxillary sinus, and uh, that dictates the position of the implant as well. So here I'm going to show some cases at first that I've done that were the intramaxillary technique. So here's a quadruple zoop, uh, zygomatic implant for a failed all on four. So I see lots of patients with atrophic maxillas. A well-meaning surgeon will place, um, you know, an all on four. And of course, what happens is they don't always last. See, if you take a look here, this patient is only 45 years old. The floor of his nose is basically paper thin. This patient um, has failed two all on fours and there's not much left for this patient. So obviously if you look at this patient, you know, the anterior maxillary wall is very, very concave. Um, there's not much left. The infraorbital nerves are pretty much right there. Now, if I was to do this case now, I would have done the extra maxillary technique, but this case is at least 10 years old. So at that time I was doing the intramaxillary technique and you can see in order to have the implants come out in a favorable position, position, I had to use very long implants, and my cantilever arm was quite long. Um, so uh, going back, this patient, his restoration would come undone once a year, and we have to go back and tighten it. So, you know, we, through trials and tribulations, we learn from, from our, what we've, you know, done in the past. So this case that was done in an intramaxillary fashion would have been more favorable to do in a uh, extramaxillary fashion now. And like I said, We'll go take a look. So this is a quad zygoma I did on this patient with an immediate uh, conversion. So this patient 
uh, obviously had uh, a restoration on the same day. Now, what's interesting about this case is you can see young gentleman, strong, strong masseters, strong muscles. He was a clencher. He had a lower overdenture, which, um, you know, was failing. And we did offer to have him uh, come back and have a uh, um, lower um, all on four. Actually, just last year, I was going to place um, uh, four to five implants to the all on four. And this patient decided to go overseas because um, the cost was a fraction of what we could do it. Um, so I, I caution patients when they go anywhere uh, overseas uh, to any other country, if they're going to have something done, make sure they're able to go back if there's a complication. Uh, because this patient did develop a complication. You can see the bottom restoration came out with the implant in it. Um, so now he's back to square one, unfortunately. But, uh, you know, you always have to be prepared to deal with your own complications. That's why I tell all my colleagues or when I do my courses, if you're going to do a surgery, either be prepared to deal with a complication or know who to send it to to fix it for you. Now, here's a case where I did a combination of pterygoid and zygomatic implants for a very atrophic maxilla. Here you see this gentleman, uh, looks like he's got a combination syndrome, almost looks like a class three malocclusion because he's 50 years old, has been wearing a denture his entire life. And uh, he, you know, he obviously came across um, some you know, funds and he was able to come in to have surgery done to get this procedure done. Here you can see, if you take a look, this gentleman has lost at least a centimeter and a half of bone in the anterior maxilla. And how do I know that? Because if you look here, that incisive papilla that used to be way up here is now all the way down here. So he's lost all that bone. This is a tough case because, uh, you know, this, this gentleman has been wearing a denture for a long time. He could no longer wear a denture because his maxilla was so flat, there was no retention. Um, so what do I do for him? Obviously, uh, preoperatively, what we want to do is measure the lower half of the face. We measure the nasion to pogonion. Uh, and do you really want to not change their uh, vertical dimension, their, basically their face is going to change a little bit, but you have to make sure that you don't make too many changes uh, because you're going to affect their speech, you're going to affect their appearance, and some patients, are that's not what they want. So what I do here is my incision is a hemi Lefort type. But keep in mind, if your incision is too far to the palatal, you're going to have a hard time reflecting that mucosa over, and you might tear it. So you, my incision... Um, is mid-crest a lot more to, towards the buckle on these cases. Now, keep in mind, this is a, um intramaxillary case I did, but that becomes so much more important when you do the extra maxillary technique. And uh, I'll go over uh, why. But remember, so the crestal incision is more to the buckle for easier reflection, and you're going to have a vertical release posteriorly, close to the malar buttress, because if you don't, release close to the malar buttress, you're not going to be able to um, dissect all the way up to the zygomatic arch. And, um, you know, some people release their incision anteriorly. I go pair midline. I don't go, I don't release the incisive papilla there. I've had a few patients over the years that had incisive nerve damage from previous uh, surgeries, and it's quite painful. So I, I avoid the incisive foramen altogether for that reason. But remember, you must expose the malar buttress, and uh, you want to stay away. You want to stay away from uh, the inferior aspect of the malar buttress. So here you can see uh, what I've done is I've exposed the malar buttress here, right? Now, if you go to if you go into this dark area down below, if you go underneath it, you're going to hit the infratemporal fossa. So we try to stay away from the infratemporal fossa and the attachments of the superior portion of the masseter muscle because you can get into some bleeding. Most of us are doing these surgeries in the office. Um, you know, although I know lots of colleagues of mine that are overseas, they do this kind of surgery in the hospital, and they don't load the implants right away. But it's become, you know, uh, quite common for us to do these in the office because the patients want to have immediate gratification. They want to leave with teeth, and it's kind of hard to do lab, dental lab work or have acrylic flying everywhere in the hospital in the operating room. They just won't allow it. That's why, for me, this is an office-based surgery. Um, but, you know, I want to minimize the chance of any hemorrhaging or any bleeding. Now, if I do get into bleeding there, when I've gone into the infratemporal region or if I've cut the masseter, uh, I have a bovi, you know, we have a surgical cell, we have avatine at our disposal, which is microfibular collagen. But nonetheless, you have to be really cautious when you do your soft tissue dissection. 
you're going to go along the inferior and frontal lateral surfaces of the zygoma. And like I said, the two areas to avoid are the infratemporal fossa, and of course, more importantly, is the orbit. Um, so, as I said, mentioned, uh, let's always respect the masseter muscle and the orbit. Here you can see following the zygomatic dissection, the maxillary sinus is fenestrated um, because, you know, I'm, I'm actually, my initial goal in this patient was to do a, a quad zygoma. And uh, I changed my operative plan and I did a zygomatic implant and pterygoid implant in that area. But if you could see here, this is a traditional intrasinus um, I, uh, technique. I made a 10 by five millimeter infra zygomatic window because you keep in mind that when you do the traditional intramaxillary zygomatic implant, it's a blind procedure. So I urge everyone that is doing these surgeries, you need to master both because sometimes you have to make changes in the middle of surgery. And you need to know that when you're doing the traditional um, zygomatic implant, it's a blind dissection. Um, you need to know your anatomy very well and uh, just in order to avoid getting in trouble. But here you can see that I'm keeping the Schneiderian membrane intact. I'm reflecting along the lateral uh, superior portion of the zygomatic arch. Um, and going back a couple of slides, on the left-hand side, you see the zygomatic notch retractor. So the zygomatic notch retractor is something that, um, obviously, I, this is a, the one that I developed myself. Um, I do every single case with this retractor. Uh, I encourage you to either use uh, a retractor that you can, uh, you know, get into that frontal zygomatic notch. Otherwise, you can't see where you're going. You don't have to expose the notch completely, but you want to make sure that the tip of that retractor, which is down here, is into that zygomatic notch. And I'll, I'll show why. But this is one that I developed myself a few years ago. I'd say about 10, 15 years ago, I, there was not a big market for zygomatic implants at the time. So it wasn't produced, uh, although now it's being sold. But nonetheless, you can use an OB-Gazer um, or, you know, I think um, there are lots of other comparable products. So following placement of the implants, well, then we did take our um, hybrid temporary prosthesis. Um, and I have a lab in my office with the prosthodontist or general dentist, whoever is doing the conversion. They are working together uh, in cohort to do an immediate conversion. So what happens is patients that I do the surgery on, I find the success rate is so much higher from every aspect when the patient leaves my office with fixed teeth. I know some people like to perform the surgery, put on these white or silver um, comfort caps and have the patient come the following day to have the teeth installed. Um, once you master this procedure and you do it at a, um, at a fast enough pace, um, you can do it all in one day. This surgery should take no more than three and a half to four and a half hours. I remember the first one I ever did took nine hours and it was an absolute nightmare. But I, you know, it was my very first one and it was a little over 20 years ago. Um, but uh, when a patient comes back the following day, they're all beat up, they're in pain, they're bruised. I'll show some pictures of what the patient looks like the next day. They don't want to sit there in your chair to have you take off these caps and put on their restoration. So I would encourage you to do your um, temporary hybrid the same day, not the next day and not the next week. I evaluate the occlusion intra-op, but remember they're under uh, deep sedation or general anesthesia, so the bite may change. So I immediately check it again post-op and at one week myself and at one month myself. And during that time, um, they can see the restorative doctor as many times as they want, but I make it a, a mission for myself to see him immediately one week later and one month later. Uh, and I don't uh, give the green light for the final restoration for at least four months. Some of my colleagues go even six months, but it all depends on um, you know, the primary stability I get. Now with the Norris implants, because they have a deeper cutting, more aggressive thread pitch, um, the primary stability and torque values I get are far superior to any product I've used in the past so I feel more comfortable uh, doing the final prosthesis at four months than I did before. But this is my patient immediately and at one week post-op. You can still see he's a little bruised. There's some bruising at the nasolabial uh, region. So you can imagine what he looked like immediately. But he's pretty beat up. But a very happy capper nonetheless because he went from having a denture to a horseshoe hybrid immediately. Um, you can see here the positioning of the 
one of the screws is somewhat palatal. So is this one here. So that's what happens with the traditional technique because you're going from the underside of the zygoma to get anchorage of that implant. Sometimes what happens is you do not get favorable palatal position. And I will be the first to admit, I've had a couple of cases that I wouldn't want to show because they were too far to the palate. Actually, um, over the last 18 years that I've been doing these, I've had one implant that was too palatal that I actually had to bury the implant and, uh, and basically abort that implant because uh, on the day of surgery, uh, we were able to load it, but it was too far to the palate and it was not what I wanted for my patients. And this is the final impression that uh, you know, our, uh, my prosthodontist is taking basically at the, at the, on this case, at the six month mark, you can see there's two pterygoids, there's two zygomas and two anterior uh, implants. Uh, you can see they use the blue moose to uh, do a pickup and uh, verify the jig and uh, to make the bar. Um, this patient had a fixed restoration fabricated, like I said, six months later, and his is the final restoration. Looks pretty good. And even though the position of those screws is somewhat palatal, the patient did not complain because it certainly beats um, having a denture, but uh, you and I all know that uh, we want to have them in a more favorable position towards the buckle. And that's one of the reasons why I've moved away from the intramaxillary technique towards the extramaxillary technique. So you go from a denture to that. That's, pr that's really nice. And this patient has a wonderful smile now. At some point, he's going to come back for the lowers. This is the final restoration. So I do have patients that come to me who have gone through numerous reconstructive efforts in the past. And what we find is when you do a big sandwich bone graft or onlay bone graft from the hip to the maxilla, over time it can resorb. This is a patient that had a Lafort osteotomy done at a very young age for an ectodermal dysplasia. So, um, you know, about 40 years ago, he had um, a hip graft done to his anterior maxilla. And you can see that how deficient he is on the, in the picture where he's wearing a blue shirt uh, compared to the other one. It looks like his, basically he's typical class three. His chin is uh, at the, almost uh, completely ahead of his, nose, his lip, upper lip. And look on the left side. He's got zygomatic implants and a restoration in place. Look at his smile. It's a world of a difference. This patient went from having a very flat malar eminence to a full malar eminence and a full cheek just with four zygomatic implants. So you go from something like this on the left or a Lafort osteotomy, you see the screws and plates that were there from 20 years ago. I didn't have to take them out. I avoided touching them. This is still the intramaxillary technique. And uh, just with four zygomatic implants, we change this patient's appearance and his life. So um, there are lots of techniques out there. I tell patients, yes, you can have uh, bilateral sinus lifts, you can have a hip graft, but the results are not immediate and they're not guaranteed. So I'm gonna show you cases where I've had patients that have come to me, they've already had failed restorations done elsewhere. This patient um, came in um, with cause, you know, I've, like I said, I've, it's all trials and tribulations. What I found from the very first case that I showed you with a 40 year old man that had uh, four zygomatic implants and his restoration came loose was the strong, the long cantilever arm um, can be beat by placing one implant anteriorly. So this is what I've done for some of these cases. Here's a case, like I said, looks like a combination syndrome, very deficient maxilla. So if I can find some room up front, either in the vomer or in the premaxilla, to place one implant, I can defeat that rocking. Because what happens is these things tend to loosen. The screws, you have four little screws holding in a big restoration. So here, what I did is I placed one anterior implant. And that avoids the need for a patient coming back in once a year to tighten the restoration because it's, screw, it's getting loose. The patient that I showed earlier who went overseas, he actually had his own screwdriver, and, uh, which is not what you want uh, because they can do some damage to the implants and screws, but he was tightening his own screws once a year. His restorative doctor gave it to him. So this is uh, uh, what I have learned, and I'm sharing that with you. If you can, if you know, the goal is always to have one implant somewhere up front to prevent that lever arm, the strong lever arm. These are 52 millimeter implants. Um, so then, you know, we have some cases that are failed traditional implants or even failed zygomatic implants. Those are always the toughest ones to deal with. 
So here I have a patient with an atrophic maxilla and a failed zygomatic, I mean, a failed all important zygomatic implant. So here you see the patient had uh, what appeared to be something, you know, a nice restoration in, initially. Um, you know, when the, the doctor did these zygomatic implants at that time, they were anterior, but the apex of the implant wasn't so low like it should have been. So it kind of blocked out a lot of the rest of the zygoma for placement zygomatic implants and like a second one. So I actually had to crisscross these. And, um, you know, there are some indications, um, some cases where you purposely cross your zygomatic implants, uh, but there's no right or wrong way to do it. You just have to keep in mind when you cross your zygomatic implants, you want to look at the sinus angle and the, obviously the orbital, the orbit always is very crucial. Uh, you want to avoid a collision with your other implant as well. So not only are we trying to avoid the infratemporal fossa down below, we're trying to avoid the orbit. We're also trying to avoid the other implants. So in this case, this patient had one implant free floating in the nose, one that was in the vomer and broken off. So I had to come up with a way to basically save the case. So we basically placed two additional zygomatic implants in a more posterior position, but they had to be crossed in order to be in that dense zygomatic bone because um, the, uh, the alternatives were, were not good. I mean, this patient uh, had no other choice going from a fixed restoration. Uh, she did not want to be in a, in a removable situation. So up to this point, I think I've, I've done a lot of uh, um, reviewing of cases that I've done with the traditional intramaxillary technique. And um, basically, um, you know, with the new Norris medical system, the cases are so much easier to do. And many of you that are, are listening today and watching uh, may look at some of the cases I presented and say, well, this might be a little too hard for me to do. Well, it's not. With the new, uh, with the Norris Medical, it's, it's, a, it's really so much easier. And I'll go over the case, I'll go over the surgical setup, and we're going to dissect the case from start to finish so you can see how much easier it is. So if you have any questions, please feel free to email me or send me an Instagram uh, message. Uh, it's Broom into World Surgery. I know a lot of people reached out to me on, on the Instagram uh, to get the, the login for the, for the course. But if you have any questions, I'm available with, with via either one of them. So the extra maxillary technique, how is it different? Let's talk about this. So with the extra maxillary technique, we're taking advantage of the um, anatomy of the zygoma and sinus, placing the implant in a more favorable position the body of the implant, depending on the Zaga classification, can be either touching the zygomatic, uh, you know, the antral wall or the sinus, or in it or completely outside of it. If you're doing a double zygomatic implant, sometimes that anterior implant, you have no choice but to have part of it be in the sinus. But um, based on what I've seen, these implants are you can you there you can use them in the extra or intramaxillary approach, and sometimes you don't have a choice. Like I said, the anatomy of the maxilla and zygoma dictates what you do, um, and of course the pre-op CT scan is most crucial. But this is a very highly predictable system, very high success rate for an atrophic maxilla. So um, going back to that, this is um, a, a slide just to kind of tell you uh, something, some information about the Norris medical system. It's placed via the extra maxillary protocol, which is a modification of the traditional Branamark technique. I mean, many of us that do Branamark uh, implants uh, have had to place their implant in an extra maxillary fashion. That's why they came up with implants to be used in an extra maxillary fashion. But the problem with their implants is sometimes the diameter of the implant body and tip is very different. So you have a hard time placing them. With, with, the, with the Norris implants, the great thing is the diameter of the implant is 4.2 millimeters all the way up and down. So that makes life a lot easier. Um, the body of the implant is very smooth, so it prevents damage to the sinus membrane. And the zygomatic implant is very aggressive at the, at the tip. So the cutting edge has deep fluted burrs and you get very high torque values. And I'm very comfortable uh, loading these implants right away. And unlike the previous intramaxillary implants where sometimes you had to get bicortical stability, the tip of the implant stuck out a couple of millimeters. You don't have to do that with the Norris implants. Um, 
and I'll, I'll show you some great cases. What I find now, what's interesting is with all those previous cases that I showed, most of the abutments I used for those are 17 or 32 degrees. And the reason for that is because the implant's kind of palatal. Now, because the implant's in a more favorable buccal position at the, at the crest, you, my most common go-to abutment is the 45 degree angle abutment, although you can get them anywhere from, you know, from 17 to 60 degrees, but I rarely use the opposite extremes. So it's especially designed, the implant, like I said, for the extra maxillary approach. The length is available anywhere from 30 to 60, uh, although the 60, I believe, is not FDA approved in the U.S. yet, but I have yet to need anything longer, longer than the 57.5. Internal connections is, is a traditional 2.4 millimeter uh, internal hex. It's a Zimmer type connection. So, um, you know, actually I've had a couple of cases where, um, you know, I've actually noticed that my restorative doctor, and I, and I wouldn't advocate this, but he had used a Zimmer component uh, because he ended up dropping the screw on the floor and didn't have the screw. So he was able to use a Zimmer screw um, in, in the middle of surgery. But what's great about the smooth body is there's no chance of attachment of the sinus membrane to it. You know, even in the best case, I've had a couple of patients that I did the intramaxillary technique, sinus membrane was completely intact. Patient developed a sinus infection four or five years later, the sinus membrane would have adhered and scarred down to the, the basically the, the uh, implant body, which was treated uh, with threads and had a, um, you know, uh, a very, very, uh, I'd say, adherent surface. These are RBM treated surfaces of the threaded part, which increases the part of the implant that grabs the bone. Um, so like I said, 2.4 millimeter internal connection is pretty standard. And I, the sharp and deep threads, I can't say enough about them because the primary stability you get from these implants is second to none. It's, uh, it's very, very impressive. And you'll see a couple of cases that, uh, that I'm gonna show you following this. So the, what's the advantage of this technique, the extra maxillary technique versus the intramaxillary technique? Well, the biggest advantage is, first of all, the surgery is so much easier to do, but the prosthetic platform is shifted to a more buccal favorable position. So that way your restoration looks like a typical hybrid uh, all on four. So the patient isn't going to feel this bulky plastic and the roof of their mouth. Sometimes um, some of the zygomatic cases that I've done or I've seen done by others, the restoration looks like a denture just missing a small part of the palate because the implants are so far to the palate. And that's not uh, what these patients want. The surgical kit, uh, this is uh, one of the older kits. It has a uh, you know, medium and a longer burr, but the burrs can be anywhere from 30 to 80 millimeters. Um, so to account for the, um, the different uh, heights and size of the zygoma. Going back to this slide, this uh, threaded portion of the implant is about 16 millimeters long. Why is that? Because that's going to be the average length of that, that zygomatic body that you're going to enter. So basically, at the very worst case scenario, even if you're longer, you could have at least 16 millimeters of threaded implant in the body of the zygoma. It tapers to 3.5 millimeters up at the apex, but it's a gradual taper. Um, some of the other systems out there do not have a tapered implant. And some, what happens is in the process of performing your osteotomy, sometimes you lose primary stability. So the great thing about the Norris system is sometimes you can slightly underprepare your osteotomy and let the cutting flutes of the implant do the rest of the work. But nonetheless, it, and this kit has the biggest game changer. These diamond burrs have made our lives as zygomatic implant surgeons so much easier. And it comes in a coarse, medium, and fine. Um, and I'll go over how to use these. Uh, but the kit is very nice. This is uh, the smaller kit. There's a more premium surgical kit as well. I think I have a picture of that. Um, it's grade five titanium, very biocompatible. Bio with excellent tensile strength. These implants will not fracture. Um, so keep in mind, uh, if you have underprepared an osteotomy, the chance of you fracturing the implant is very low, but you can fracture the zygomatic arch. Remember, 
most of us that are, are treating facial trauma, we see lots of psychomedical maxillary complex fractures because oftentimes that patients get hit in the face and they can fracture the zygoma. So keep in mind, you can also fracture zygoma when you're placing the implant. Um, as I mentioned, these implants go anywhere from 30 to 60 millimeters. Um, I have yet to need the 60 millimeter implant. Now there is a cover screw that comes with an implant. Why is that? Because you know, sometimes when you place your implant, you have a lip of bone at the crest that prevents you from placing your abutment. So you put the cover screw in there to smooth out that bone without damaging the internal surface of the implant and then you dispose of the cover screw. Um, so as I mentioned, the implant is 4.2 millimeters at, for the whole cylinder, the diameter at the apex is 3.5, comes all the way from 30 to 57.5. And now this picture is the drilling sequence, it's quite important. Now the burrs come, there's, there's three different sizes, small, you know, it's, I would say one, two, three. The, the difference is the tip. So if you take a look at this, there's also a depth gauge there. The depth gauge is also very helpful when you're trying to orient the orbital line because if I place my anterior implant first, I want to make sure I'm away from the orbit. So I use this depth indicator as a good guide, and I'll, I'll show, a, a show how I use it in the case coming up. But what's so unique about these burrs, the one, two, and three? First of all, I rarely use the third one. So if you look at that first burr, the diameter at the very tip is two millimeters. Remember what I said, the tip of that implant at the apex is 3.5 millimeters. So the first four millimeters here is only two millimeters, four millimeters in height of that burr. The second four millimeters is 2.5 millimeters. The third portion between eight and 16 is three millimeters. So even if you drill with your first burr to full, full depth, your osteotomy is still much smaller than the head of your implant. So 90% of my cases are drilled with burr number one. So if I go to place an implant after I've done my first burr uh, osteotomy and I get a lot of resistance. And actually I had one case, uh, the very first Norris case I did, I uh, underprepared it by uh, half the length of the first burr and I felt like I was gonna fracture the zygoma. So I always use my first burr to full length. So the first burr goes to full length. If I go to place this implant and I get too much resistance, I'll take the second burr. Remember the second burr, the first eight millimeters is only 2.8 millimeters, still seven millimeters less than the tip of your implant, which is 3.5 millimeters. So I will drill this. You can drill this to half the length if you don't get a lot of resistance. But remember the second portion is already three, three millimeters. It's the same diameter as here. Um, I rarely, I've only used bird number three one time, and that was an extremely dense D1 zygomatic bone. Remember, the, the middle portion of the zygomatic bone is that cancellous bone. It's still pretty dense, but we're interested in that zygomatic bone that's very dense, the D1 bone. Nonetheless, you rarely ever have to use this last burr the full length. And if you do, you could lose primary stability because remember, this implant, this, this burr is 3.2 millimeters here. So keep in mind, most of my cases that I show, the burrs that are you see are burr number one. Rarely do I use two and hardly ever burr number three. This is the surgical kit once again. Uh, this kit is an older kit. It does not have a round burr in it. The new kits now have a round burr and they have four lengths of burrs. This is the, the surgical kit. It uh, comes in, uh, like I said, the, the step grills. Uh, I call them forming burrs. And of course the diamond burrs, which is 4.2 millimeters, they're 30 millimeters in length to account for the shortest implant. And this will create the groove in your antral wall. This is the, shows the step grills. There's a, um, um, the 40, 60, and 80 millimeter ones. And now there's a shorter one as well, which is 30 millimeters to account for the shortest implant. What's great about these step grills that no other system has is it has depth markings. So this basically works as a depth gauge as well when you're placing the implant. Now keep in mind, I have my own uh, zygomatic notch retractor that I use that's sitting in the zygomatic notch. So if the tip of my burr hits that, that, not, that retractor, I know to stop. And at that point, I measure my depth. That is not my final depth. That just gives me an idea of the size of the implant that I'm going to use. 
But like I said, burr number one, I rarely have to go beyond burr number one. I'm at the tip, it's two millimeters. The first four millimeters are two millimeters. Now these zygomatic burrs for preparation of the groove have changed the zygomatic implant world. They really have. So these uh, zygomatic, so basically this diamond burr is used to create a channel all the way from the crest to the entry point into the zygoma. And they have basically um, changed uh, the way we do implants. They have changed the way we do zygomatic implants. Uh, the coarse gritty one is obviously the first one you use. Um, so what I do is I take a round burr and make a pilot hole uh, into where um, I think would be the correct trajectory, to, of course, to avoid the infratemporal fossa and the orbit. And then I use my, my coarse gritty diamond to deepen a groove in that area. And, you know, you always have to check your orientation. Um, um, this is a, a case, a stock case. Uh, I'm going to go over uh, my cases in a few minutes. But the, the multi-unit components are very, very easy to use. They come in numerous heights. And uh, what happens is with the traditional intramaxillary ones, uh, a lot of those implants had a carrier. Once you took off the carrier, it was very difficult to re reposition your implant. With the Norris implant, it's quite easy. So if you place your implant and you're off by half a turn, you're not happy with the position of your, your multi-unit abutment, you can basically um, move your implant a quarter of a turn because the carrier is quite easy. It's, um, and then the, you place your multi-unit abutment and you can torque it down. Uh, you'll see what I'm talking talk about when I present the case. Here you can see you can use straight or multi-unit abutments. They go all the way from 2 to 5 millimeters in height, and the angulation goes all the way from 17 to 60 degrees. You hardly ever have to use a 60-degree one. Like I said, I usually live here between 45 and 30. Um, these are their tough implants. So if I'm using um, an anterior implant, I would place a tough implant. If I'm doing a combination with a pterygoid case, I'll use the pteri, uh, pterygoid implant. It's got a smooth, polished color to account for that thick tissue and the retromolar uh, tuberosity region. Now, what's great about the, the system is you have these guide pins. So, uh, you know, it's happened to all of us where we open up an abutment. It's not the right abutment. So you waste an abutment uh, because you're not happy with the angulation. Well, here you have these sterilizable guide pins that you basically put inside the implant to make sure you're picking the right abutment. And, uh, you know, I, I value these because that way I don't uh, go through unnecessary abutments. Similar systems, like I said, are Nobel. Southern Implants, just lots of other systems out there. But these are the other two uh, competitors. And like I said, I've moved away from everyone uh, just because Norris Medical has made my life uh, so easy. The implants are, are quite easy to use. This is the drilling protocol. Uh, obviously, contraindications to placement of zygomatic implants or an acute infection of the maxillary sinus, history of pathology or trauma. And, uh, of course, you know, you have to inform these patients uh, that there are risks. Um, you know, you tell them that there is a risk for development of sinus infections. There, uh, with the intramaxillary technique, obviously, it was higher. There was also a risk of developing cutaneous fistulas. And you have to, even though, um, you know, hopefully it's never happened to any of you, and it won't, but you have to tell them the orbit is close by um, because uh, an informed consent is the most important part of these zygomatic implants, um, and you, you, it can keep you out of trouble. I have yet to find a good zygomatic uh, implant and informed consent out there, but I've made my own. I'm more than happy to share it with anyone uh, if they want to email or send me an Instagram message, but your zygomatic uh, implant consent should be different than your traditional dental implants because the risks are far different. Um, so I'm going to go over the drilling protocol in a second, um, but the prosthetic phase is no different than your traditional all on four. Now what I do tell my patients afterwards is I always tell them, if you can't cut something with your finger, you can't eat it for three months. And that will eliminate the, the, the risk of failure in these patients. So I always tell them, I say, um, the, the risk for failure goes down if you um, follow my direction. So for the most part, these patients know that if they can't cut it with their finger, they, they can't eat it. So the restorative phase, as I mentioned, is no different than a conventional all-on-follower. 
if you have a good laboratory that you work with, um, things uh, can go streamlined and they're quite easy. But I do an immediate loading for all my cases. So once I place the implant, I place the multi-unit abutment, we put a non-engaging cylinder over it with a lab screw, and then my lab and my restorative dentist take over. So basically the cases are converted every single time in my office. The patient does not leave the office without uh, a temporary hybrid. Okay. Um, this is a, a clinical case. It's a stock clinical case, but I want to show how the groove preparation um, uh, proceeds. So here you see the coarse diamond burr being placed into a, uh, a entry point here. So this entry point was made with a round burr. In my own cases, it'll be a little closer and the quality of pictures will be a little bit better. But I just, nonetheless, I'm going to show you. If you do visit the Norris website, you'll see some of these pictures and it's very self-explanatory. But what you see here is the surgeon is preparing the groove without violating the snidier membrane. Look at that. It's not perforated. And then you can push it back with a periosteal elevator and place your implant into the recipient portion of the zygoma. Now, if you look here, this surgeon has a Selden retractor. I don't see a, a zygomatic notch retractor, but um, I always have a zygomatic notch retractor in the zygomatic notch. And that way I see exactly where my implant's going. You don't have to expose the zygomatic notch for every single case, but you should definitely know where the tip of your implant's going. And you should be aware of that. And uh, because it's very easy to get confused and place your implant um, close to the orbit. And that's definitely a no-no. Uh, here you're correcting the angulation with a 45 degree multi-unit abutment. As I mentioned, this is a smooth body of the implant and you can correct that with a 45 degree abutment. Here you have two zygomas and a pterygoid. Um, that, that's gonna give you great primary stability. Um, so some surgeons will use bone graft material or HA to cover this body of the implant, the cylinder portion, so patients don't place it. I don't do that. What I do is I free up the buccal fat pad and bring it over and close it to the midline. And I get great results with that. And that way the patients do not feel that the body of the implant. You can do a bone graft, uh, but you know, nonetheless, with HA, I've had a couple of cases over the years that I've seen the HA break and fragment off and then become secondarily infected. Uh, I learned that early on when I was doing um, you know, head and neck surgery and doing facial fractures, that HA cement can fragment off. And if it does, then it becomes a foreign body and uh, risk for infection goes up. So keep that in mind. The product that you're using up there needs to be something that is stable. That's why I use the buckle fat pad. And the buckle fat pad obviously is something that we all know how to use. We use it to close oral antral fistulas. Uh, but that, uh, it's interesting, I'm gonna show a case um, or, uh, where we use the buccal fat pad to close um, a fistula from a zygomatic implant. So at this point, uh, I'm going to move on to my clinical cases. And nonetheless, like I said, feel free to email or send me an Instagram message to Broom and Dual Surgery. And I'm more than happy to to uh, to answer them and follow ups if you have uh, if you're interested in future courses that I'm going to be putting on with Norris. So this is actually a course that I put on with Norris Medical. Uh, we did this course in Miami with a cadaver course. It was great. Uh, we had about um, 15 doctors, uh, some surgeons, some restorative doctors, and we actually got to place pterygoid and zygomatic implants on cadavers. So um, it was, we had a great turnout. Obviously, with the pandemic, um, you know, we had to uh, postpone some, some courses that we were going to have now, but we'll have some in the future. Uh, this is another one. This is a one-day course that we did uh, for um, in Miami again, that we did on cadavers. Um, this is another one uh, that was very successful. We did a live uh, uh, you know, lecture and uh, cadaver course um, with uh, my partner here, Dr. Garg, and of course, this is the retractor. Um, this is the retractor that I was mentioning to you guys, if you're interested, Osteolife Biomedical sells them. I don't get anything from it. Uh, except uh, I guess my name lives on through the retractor. I don't even think it's named after me. Nonetheless, uh, it's a retractor that I designed years ago with uh, KLS Martin, and they were not interested in producing it because back then there was hardly any surgeons. There was only 100 surgeons nationwide doing zygomatic retractors, uh, doing zygomatic surgery. But now it's it's very, very common. It's, it's, uh, it's a great, great procedure and great service to our patients. Once again, like I said, 
you'll be able to see this later on uh, online. So now I'm going to show you a case for a quadruple zygomatic implant for failed all on four and then with an atrophic maxilla, just like I did before with the intramaxillary technique, but now it's with Norris implants, and you'll see a difference. This patient comes to me, very young lady in her 40s, who had two failed all on fours. It's quite unfortunate because, um, you know, these all on fours, if they're done properly early on, and someone with a robust amount of bone shouldn't fail. Nonetheless, it failed. And I think sometimes you have to keep in mind the patient um, is the biggest risk factor for failure of the implant. Um, so I have actually added to my informed consent that if the patient alters the restoration, I am no longer responsible for the um, the implant. So actually, I've had a couple of patients um, over the over the years that I've noticed they altered their own restoration with a nail file because they didn't like the shape of the teeth. Well, these implants aren't designed to take those lateral forces a week after surgery, and they can fail. Nonetheless, you can see that uh, I did this case in my office. This was done under general anesthesia. I have my anesthesiologist in my office. Uh, the patient gets intubated for this case, but I don't always do uh, intubations. Some of these cases that are done uh, with an open airway, um, and of course, you know, you can do it with just deep sedation. It can even be done with local anesthesia, but I, you know, obviously, um, I have my patient's comfort in mind, so I don't do these with local anesthesia. Uh, and I don't do my own sedation when I do these zygomatic implants. For a conventional all-on-four, I do my own sedation for single arch all the time, but with these cases, I tend to shy away from it. Here you can see the pre-op. She's got a deficient maxilla in zones two and three, and uh, she's got a very robust zygomatic arch. Um, it's a little flat laterally out here, but it's pretty robust. There's plenty of room there. So what? remember what I talked about with my incision. So Incision is, is key. It's a crestal incision to the buckle. Okay. Now you can see here that my incision is um, mid crestal more to the buckle because that way you, it allows you to release, get better reflection. And I do a vertical release posteriorly. You saw the vertical release posteriorly um, behind the tuberosity that is aimed towards the malar buttress. Um, I, my anterior release goes all the way from the nasal floor down to the crest. My release is, I have two releases anteriorly, you see that. So I keep the incisive pupilla intact because I want to avoid any issues with nerve pain. I've seen it in the past. And I want to have something to close my buccal fat pad to. You'll see how that works. So avoid your incision into the vestibule as well. That's very important because I've, I've heard of a couple of cases where someone released their incision out here in the vestibule and they damaged the parotid duct. That can happen where you're damaged stents in the duct. So keep that in mind, always be aware of your anatomy. And um, because remember, you have to expose the malar buttress um, to get all the way up to the zygomatic heart. So here you see uh, my pre-op um, markings. I, I mark every incision before I make it. I make this with a sharp 15 blade all the way down to periosteum, and you develop a full thickness mucoperiosteal flap because all the vital structures that can be damaged are within that flap. So as long as you don't tear your periosteum, you're okay. Here you see I make a full thickness flap. I reflect it with a, with a sharp periosteal uh, elevator, and that way I, I avoid damage to any vital structures. Um, lighting is key, and you have to see what you're doing. So I expose my malar buttress all the way. You can see here I expose it with a periosteal elevator. The uh, Minnesota retractor goes up there. And if you look on the very bottom here, you can see my zygomatic notch retractor pop. If you dissect this properly, it goes right above the zygomatic notch and it pops right in there. Obviously, if you're too far up, you can pop into the orbital rim easily too. So you have to look on the outside and feel uh, I always look, I always listen, and I feel, obviously, because you listen for that pop into the zygomatic notch, and you feel that to make sure you're not in the orbital floor, uh, because that zygomatic notch retractor, if it's aimed in the wrong direction, you can get um, into the orbital floor. Now, I know a lot of uh, my colleagues talk about points, lines, angles, or the orbital line or the sinus angle. Um, th that's all fantastic. You have to be aware of all that 
but uh, the reality of it is everything you look at on the CT has to translate clinically. So here clinically you see that the zygomatic notch retractor will define where um, I'm placing the tip of my implant. So um, then I, what I do is I take a, um, a round burr and make a hole on the uh, superior lateral aspect of the zygoma. Now remember, some people prefer to pay, place their posterior implant first, or I call the lower one. Some do the anterior one. What you have to make sure you do is if you're at least three millimeters from the edge of that bone here to avoid a fracture, because you don't want to out-fracture your zygoma. That can easily happen. Here you see the zygomatic notch uh, retractor in place. This is that round burr that I make. So here I'm placing my posterior implant place First, I take a round burr and I penetrate that. Uh, obviously, you might be within the sinus. So if someone has a very large pneumatized sinus, that round burr, that round osteotomy can end up in the sinus. And then at that point, your implant is you know, partially intrasinus. But you know, we're, our goal is to, to maintain an extra maxillary technique. And see here, we're at least three millimeters from the edge of the zygoma to avoid an out fracture of the zygoma. And here I'm avoiding the infratemporal fossa. Because remember, the superior portion of the masseter muscle attaches here. And you want to avoid damaging that to avoid getting into any bleeding as well. Then I take my coarse diamond burr. You see, this is the coarse diamond burr that's in that kit. And as I said, I can't stress enough um, how much of a game changer this diamond burr is. It, it allows you, so you put the tip of this diamond burr into that round hole that you prepare with the round burr. And basically, you can move this in a, uh, in a sagittal vector to create your channel. So basically, you try to start up here and, this, and close to that hole and create a, a channel. And as you lay your hand down inferiorly onto the bone, you're going to deepen your channel. So remember, if you look at this channel, if I have to describe it, you're creating this portion of the channel first because the tip of that burr sits here. And as you deepen the groove, you're going to create a full channel. And this channel is, uh, you can basically lay a flat instrument in there. You can lay the depth indicator in there. And you'll see the vector of where your implant is being placed. Now, keep in mind here, I said I did the posterior implant first. There is no right or wrong way to do it. If you're doing the anterior implant first, you want to be five to seven millimeters away from the infraorbital rim. And your implants always have to be about 10 millimeters apart to give you a good proper AP spread and good favorable position. Um, so if you're placing two zygomatic implants, you're going to be about a centimeter apart. The bodies of the implants are going to be about a centimeter apart. But so what you see here is I, I place the diamond burr, I pivot the tip into that hole and redirect along the path of insertion. And they're at least 10 millimeters apart. So I'm here, I'm deepening that groove. And um, you can see here that the part of the, zy the buccal fat pattern is now popped out, which is fine because I'm going to take this buccal fat pattern and free it up and at the end of my surgery, bring it over the body of these implants to cover those implants. Um, so as I, I move away the membrane a little bit from my osteotomy because I don't want to perforate this membrane, then I take my medium and, round and fine burr and oh, I flatten out the groove. Now what I do, I know some, some colleagues uh, 3D print their uh, their immediate restoration. Uh, what I've traditionally done is I have a patient that has a denture ready to go. And once we know the implants have achieved primary stability, we convert that denture into a hybrid, uh, and then three to four months later, they get their final. So what we do is we have a clear duplicate of that denture. So when I have this clear duplicate of that denture, uh, prior to placing the implants, I make sure the trajectory of my implants the head of the implant falls within this clear channel. To, and this clear channel, I've, I've, you know, I've sat down with my restorative doctor or the prosthodontist, and we've decided that these are going to be on, you know, close to the buccal crest, the portion of the crest. I don't want them to be in a palatal position. So this clear channel, this clear guide is duplicate, is fabricated by my lab. So here you see the posterior implant getting ready to be placed. Uh, the buccal fat pad just sits there until we're done with surgery. Here you have the zygomatic notch retractor. The tip of the implant is going to end up here. I don't want it to come outside the bone. So what happens in the, in the old uh, intramaxillary technique, sometimes in order to get uh, stabilization, I apologize, uh, you have to get bicortical stability. 
So you would have the implant come in through the inferior portion of the zygoma and then go out to the superior cortex. And with those implants uh, that had very non-aggressive threads, sometimes uh, the tip had to come out two or three millimeters to get good primary stability. And that became a problem itself. And I'll show that when I go over my complications section. But here, you see this cottonoid. Now, what is this for? So I use these cottonoids commonly when I'm doing uh, frontal sinus fractures uh, or orbital floor fractures. I basically soak it with cocaine or soak it with, top, with, top, with local anesthetic, and it works great as he, for hemostasis. Also, I lay it. So once I push in that, that floor, that, uh, the, this sinus membrane, the sinus membrane, and it's intact, I basically place one of these into the osteotomy site to protect my sinus membrane. What does that do? If the burr happens to catch anything, it's not gonna catch that. It won't catch your membrane and cut your membrane because the goal is to minimize any chance of damage to that membrane at all times. So I, I gently, you can actually take this, this uh, you know, these are radiographic markers in it so it doesn't get lost. Uh, you can order these in bulk from your surgical supplier. But basically, this is the smallest one that I had available and you pack it into your, your little osteotomy. So you see here, it's packed in there, it's soaking up the blood, and I push it in there really nicely. You can almost have it disappear. You don't see it anymore, but it's there and it's protecting your sinus membrane. So when I do my osteotomy, if my burr happens to catch something, guess what? It catches this guy and not the sinus membrane. Because what happens is when you put in this tip of this burr, sometimes you have to redirect and you get close to the sinus membrane and what you want to do is avoid having to tear that. So this guy is protecting, this cottonoid is protecting my, uh, my membrane at all times. Um, like I said, 90% of my cases are done with burr number one. I hardly ever have to use burr number two and rarely, rarely ever burr number three. Uh, I think three people raised their hand. Uh, let, me, let me see. Oh, yeah, I, I apologize. You're right. It is too late not to see. I, uh, so I'm showing the surgical steps. Uh, yes, I took out those um, slides. All right, I will answer all these questions um, at the very end. So here you see the um, um, cottonoid stuck to the, the burr. I take it off and you can replace it. But at that point, you've managed to avoid any kind of damage to um, the uh, zygoma. I think I got uh, to the membrane. There we go. So now we're getting ready to place our implant. So uh, once again, we drill to depth with our number one burr. And the great thing about these implants or the burrs is that they're marking the radiographic. I mean, they have the, the markings are on there, not radiographic. They have uh, printed markings on the burrs. So when the tip of my burr here hits my zygomatic notch retractor, I stop, I look at the measurement, and I kind of have an idea of where I'm going to be. And generally, when I measure the implant, uh, it's about a couple of millimeters, two to two to two and a half millimeters shorter than this depth because the tip of my burr slightly comes out and hits this retractor. So if I measure 45 here, I'm probably gonna end up using a 42.5 millimeter implant only because when you put in the depth gauge in there, you're gonna try to grab the lowest portion of your osteotomy because you don't want the tip to stick out and it's generally about two and a half millimeters. Uh, shorter than the, what I measured there. Um, here you can see the implant going, being placed on a hand carrier. Um, uh, you know, the implant placement is not really blind anymore because I have been able to visualize my osteotomy all the way and my retractor is sitting there and the zygomatic notch safely protecting any vital structures. Um, this is the implant going in on a very high torque value. Like I said, the only purpose for the cover screw is to place it if you need to smooth out any bone. The implant is placed in the proper trajectory and we have plenty of room to do another implant anteriorly. Um, so here we place the implant um, and of course you can see here that the tip of the implant is um, obviously it's coming out. So this is actually one that I wanted to show that we had to redirect because the tip of the implant is coming out the zygoma. So this is one of my very first cases. And what I, the reason I'm showing this is because you can see a little green stick fracture here. If you look at that, this is one when I got a little overzealous. So we redirected that, but it's always important. So you can see here, I had to redirect it into a more superior position um, 
And that's really all what you always want to have that you want your posterior implant apex to be above the other, the, the anterior implant. That's the only way you can. So I was forced to crisscross my implants here, but nonetheless, I show this because you have to be able to deal with your complications. So when I went to place this implant by hand, because I had underprepared it, you see, I got a little green stick fracture here. So we had to re, I went through the same osteotomy and redirected it. So keep in mind uh, that, you know, you, you can't underprepare with Burr 1. Burr 1, you have to use it the full length. So here we have our, our implant being placed in the new orientation. And I placed a second implant um, in the more anterior position. And the tip of this implant is below the apex of the second, of the most posterior implant. Um, and then what we do here is we take our, our depth gauge, measure the, you know, I mean, you know, because I had to take that implant out, uh, then I placed them simultaneously. But I did my second osteotomy first to make sure that I'm away from the other implant. Because what you want to do is you want to make sure that you, you, the implants don't collide. Uh, but nonetheless, I have to deal with my own complications. So I'm showing this because everyone shows all their perfect cases. And you have to be aware that not every case always goes perfectly as planned and you have to be able to deal with it. Oh, what would be the optimum torque? Oh, but you know, the, um, some of these implants, I mean, the torque value is above 85 Newton centimeters. I mean, your torque values are, are tremendously high. And obviously, um, I, there's a couple other questions here. What about augmented views by Dr. Balan? Oh, oh Dr. Balan is great. Uh, I watched his, his webinar. I, I, like I said, I don't, augment the facial uh, aspect of my implants with bone or bone material. Um, I have, uh, and I'll show you a case where I did a product from Medtronic that is similar to BMP. It becomes bone, but I just want something that doesn't um, get mobilized. Uh, so what if a virtual system is available? How safely is it to avoid the infratemporal fossa in orbit? Obviously, a good knowledge of where they are with the 3D uh, system is what you want to do. Uh, to avoid placing the implant into the orbit or infratemporal fossa. As you can see here, I, I check myself multiple times throughout the surgery with, the, uh, with the, uh, the depth indicator. It goes into the osteotomy site. I feel the tip. I feel it from outside. So before placing the implant, and I'll show this in a second. I'm going to answer these questions in a little while. But you see here, uh, that's actually a great question. How do I avoid the infratemporal fossa and the orbit? So see, after I've done my osteotomy, this depth indicator goes in. The purpose is not only to measure the depth of the, the length of your implant, but you can also hit, feel it hit the tip of your retractor. And if I take my retractor out, I feel for it with my finger. So I'm going to put my finger outside here digitally and make sure I feel the tip of that depth indicator to know for a fact that I'm in the proper place, that I'm not in the orbit, and I'm not in the infratemporal fossa. So if I don't feel the tip of that, then I go back and redirect. Um, luckily, there's enough volume of bone with the zygoma that you can do that. But the key is to make sure at all times you know where your implant is being placed. So here we have the two implants being placed. And so now, because my first implant, if, if you noticed here, remember, I took this implant out, right? So this implant, because it was a green stick fracture, I had to take it out. So I dealt with my own complication. And as a result, I, had, I placed two zygomas and they crossed each other. So the, the posterior implant is always above the anterior implant. And that way you have enough stock and bone to do this properly. Nonetheless, look, the, the heads of the implants come out in a favorable AP position about a centimeter apart and the bodies of the implants are not touching. There's no collision here. So this is um, the crossing pattern. So you can do the, if you're doing a uncrossed pattern, obviously your implants are gonna be parallel, but here the, the crossing pattern, which is perfectly acceptable, but you just have to make sure your implants do not collide um, because that, that defeats the purpose and increases your risk for failure. But here you can see that both implants, obviously you can't see it here, but I check myself with this clear guide at all times to make sure the heads of both implants are within the channel. So then we do the same thing on the opposite side. Uh, on the opposite side, I, I you know, reflect my full thickness flap all the way down to periosteum. So this strip of attached gingiva remains 
completely intact at all times, and you'll see why. So I do, I repeat the procedure on the other side. Now here you can see I have two distinct channels that are separate from each other. Um, but look what I did here. I took my cotton oil and I slid it in there to protect both um, areas, the Schneiderian membrane at all times, so I don't violate that. And actually that was a very neat little trick um, that you know, I, I basically learned from being an oral surgeon. Basically, I use that cottonoid for orbital fractures, and, and the clip, when I'm doing funnel sinus fractures close to the brain, uh, it soaks up all the blood. So here it's the same thing. It soaks up the blood, gives me a dry field, and also reduces the risk of penetration. Once again, look what I've done here. So I take my, after I've done my osteotomies, you guys, before I place that implant, this depth gauge goes in that osteotomy at full length, and I feel it hit the tip of my zygomatic notch retractor. So one of my assistants is actually holding a Minnesota retractor. One of my assistants is using a tongue retractor here because you have to be able to see what you're doing. So here, um, oh, I do apologize, jumped. I've done both osteotomies. So for purposes of this, because uh, I'm in the process of writing a, a textbook chapter on zygomatic implants, I, I had the photos done, but normally what I would do uh, is place one implant and do the osteotomy for a second one and place that one too. But what I was trying to show here is you can do a, um, a double-barreled zygoma on one side without perforating the membrane if you take the necessary precaution. So here what I've done is, like I said, I put in the cottonoid, and that protected me at all times. You know, um, you could be the greatest surgeon, but if you're not cautious, you're going to make mistakes. And here, in order to avoid damage there, I use these cotton eyes at all times. It's a great adjunct. So here, you see me measuring. Um, and basically, what happens here is this also checks my trajectory. We place one implant. We place the second one. And here, you see we have a quad zygoma. On this side, they're not crossing. On this side, they're crossing each other. But look at the position. They're in a very ideal position on the crest of the arch and a buckle position. Now, here on this side, I think I had to remove a little bit of bone here because um, I caught a lip of bone there. But nonetheless, you can see that you have to um, you know, do what you have to do to get the multi-unit abutments to sit on there without any bony interferences. So here, uh, I put my, my clear guide in there again. And what happens here is we, we check that where the multi-unit abutments are coming out within the guide. Uh, these are... Uh, on the right side, and then we do the left side. So then you check all four at the same time. Here you can see the four multi-unit abutments in a somewhat favorable, I mean, I think they're in a favorable position. My referring doctor and their restorative dentist, uh, obviously they dictate it. So if they're not happy, uh, we take the multi-unit abutment off and then we replace it. But here uh, you see my restorative doctor is checking the position of these abutments. We're using the clear channel. They're happy with it, so then we proceed with the next step. So prior to closing my incisions, we put on the cylinders and the lab technician and my restorative doctor start the chair side conversion here. Um, so this is the final position of the abutments. Uh, we check our final position, we check the bite. So basically then they, they put in the cylinders. Uh, this is them pushing up, patient up into occlusion. This is a um, basically a, a bite registration we have taken beforehand. Uh, with the patient's existing denture, because we're trying not to change that, of course. And you can see here, this is going to be the heads of your implants. So by by using this blue mousse, so that's what they're doing here. They put blue mousse on the inside of the denture, okay? And uh, the abutment handles have now been taken off, so you only have the abutment heads in there with the white caps that I showed you earlier. So we now check, we know where the position of these implants are. These are really nicely on the buccal crest. Now we can safely remove this palatal portion of acrylic here. They hollow out the holes here um, to do the chair side reline. The cylinders are, are kept in place there. Then my laboratory technician, they put in this rubber dam over there and put in the, um, the acrylic on the, out, on the periphery of these cylinders to complete the chair side reline. Now, what I did is I took some of the patient's own bone and mixed it with some bios on this side to put over that area where I had created a fracture on the on that left side. Normally, like I said, I don't use bone grafting material. I basically um, uh, put in the buccal fat pad, but in this case, I took some bone and grafted it over where the, the 
there was a small little out fracture of, of or, or green stick fracture on my zygomatic buttress where I had over torqued that, that implant. But here they're covering the inside of these cylinders, so um, nothing else gets in there. Um, and then they can take off uh, the restoration after the this acrylic is curing, and then they go back and polish it um, when I'm doing my closure. Um, so here you see um, pack and bone over that area on that left side. This is they're using the, um, the acrylic, flowable acrylic into the, the periphery of those cylinders prior to removing it all together. Um, so this is the, the immediate um, hybrid uh, temporary. It's nicely polished. All that um, powder, uh, uh, you know, obviously acrylic is removed. Um, obviously when we do our final, we're gonna to try to make this in a, a, a smaller, more appealing uh, restoration, but the patient is very happy because they go from two failed all on fours and a denture to this. Now it comes to the closure. So uh, while my lab is outside with my restorative doctor polishing the restoration, I take my buckled fat pad and mobilize that. Look at that. It's beautiful. It's got robust blood supply. I cover the entire body of the implant. So while some of my other colleagues use bone, and that's perfectly fine, I take advantage of biology and use uh, your own material, use your buckled fat pad. I mean, some people remove the buckled fat pad for cosmetic reasons, um, and, uh, but I believe in saving it at all costs. So here we take the buckle fat pad and I bring it all the way anterior. Look at this. I brought this thing all the way to the midline and sutured it because we were able to free it up and it survives. Obviously it becomes fibrotic over the body of these implants, but uh, the patient doesn't feel the body of those implants long-term and it's a great service you're providing. Um, then when I'm done with my closure, I put the white caps back on. My restorative dentist is uh, polishing the final product. So here, you see the buckle fat pad is coming all the way from either side and sutured down. Now, obviously this buckle fat pad is pretty big and robust. It's gonna shrink down over time. Then when the restorative doc's ready, prior to waking the patient up, we take these white caps on and put in the uh, restoration. Patient goes from this to this, obviously, and uh, you've pr provided a great service and they wake up with a, with a denture. Obviously, uh, this is not the final product, this is the temp. So this is so much easier than the intramaxillary technique. It really is. And I think what's happened uh, in my practice is I basically uh, abandoned the other zygomatic implant systems. And I, I find that with Norris, you get, it's just, just a fabulous, fabulous uh, product. This is, like I said, one of our courses that we had. Um, and this is some of the, our surgeons that came to our course. They did a, sur a live surgery course, like I said. Um, uh, we're able to get have doctors get a license as long as you have the uh, uh, license somewhere else in the country. You can get a one-week license in Arizona. This is one of the courses we did in Miami. Uh, this is Ed and Nikki from Norris Medical, um, and they, uh, they were gracious enough to host uh, this course. And obviously on the other side, you see me placing some zygomatic implants with some participants on a cadaver head and using uh, uh, pterygoids. Uh, here we're using Dr. Gorg's facility in North Miami. It's a beautiful facility, but we had a great setup and a great team for these courses. I'm hoping we can do more of these. This is the other um, uh, slot course that we had done. Once again, cadavers with the Norris. These are the Norris premium kits here. We did some uh, pterygoids and zygomatic implants. So now I'm going to show you a case, uh, a couple of quick cases. I'm not going to go over all the surgical portions. Now, what about um, a case where you just have another failed all on four and, uh, and the lower? So this is a patient which has terrible dentition. Uh, her maxillary teeth have been gone for a while. Mandibular teeth have failed. And she's a candidate for an upper or lower. So what I do for these cases is I use the Norris Tough implants. In this case, it's phenomenal. So it's basically the same implant that you use in, uh, as far as the zygomatic implant. The tip, it's like a tough, but it's, 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 like a, it's basically uh, the same implant, but much shorter. You get the same aggressive thread pitch, same phenomenal primary stability. So in this case, we did a double barreled zygoma. Obviously in this um, case, they weren't crossing each other. Um, and you know, this was further down the road. I didn't have that uh, tendency to over torque and then get a green stick fracture, but nonetheless, I'm just showing you here that you know, we had the implants parallel and non-crossing and they're at least a centimeter apart. So you get good AP spread. Uh, in this case, you see the bottom and top being done at the same time so this, these cases are a little bit more challenging. 
I place five tough implants in a mandible and four zygomatic implants in the maxilla. Uh, patient wakes up with a beautiful smile. So they go from that to this. Um, and this is a great service. And obviously this patient, you change their facial profile a little bit, but nonetheless, I mean, the improvement is, is dramatic. And uh, this is prior, to, they still don't have the final restoration. Sometimes if you make your temporary restoration too good, they're not going to come back for final. So you got a beautiful smile. And I think what we'll do in the final, I think the, her doc and I have talked about is uh, giving her a little bit more bulk because she's not having as much incisal show on smiling. But the, the, these are all things that are corrected in the final. I have one more case. It's a very extreme case I want to show you. This lady had such a flat maxilla that she could no longer wear a denture. You can see there, the maxilla is completely atrophic um, and there's nothing nothing for her there. She can't wear anything. So what do we do with a case like this? We do a quad zygoma and this is her smile. She's done phenomenal. Um, now what about complications of zygomatic implants? So this is a, a older case that I did. Patient had, um, you know, a cutaneous fistula five years after placement. Well, now why is that? So on this case, I had done the traditional, um, you know, Nobel implants in the past. And in order to get primary stability, I had to come out by cortical because, uh, you know, the the burrs, um, you know, they they don't allow you to under prepare the osteotomy. If you under prepare it, the, the implant just spills. It's not self threading or self drilling or self tapping. So what happens is you basically have to get bicortical stability. So what do you do in a case like this? This is an awful complication to have. So you have to open up this, this fistula and do an apicoectomy on these implants and then debride all the soft tissue. Um, and, and obviously that's the only way to fix this. The implants are completely integrated. You can't do anything else. So what we did with this implant is I went in there, you can see I flattened out the implants with a big round football shaped burr and completely um, flatten out that area, irrigate it like crazy, because this generates lots and lots of heat. And you can see the patient now, two to three months later, completely healed. Now, this is another patient. This is not a complication of mine, but look at this patient. This patient had zygomatic implants done, and look what they developed. They developed a massive or antral fistula, and they have all this granulation tissue here. I have not repaired this, but this patient is going to need a free flap or a temporalis flap. So we're, you know, this has to be done by hospital. We have to remove this restoration. We have to remove the implants and do a temporalis or a radial forearm free flap. Um, I've given the patients both options. But look, he's developed a terrible infection here. So not only have you, they've damaged a buccal fat pad, he's developed a chronic infection here, but he's also got an oral antral fistula. Um, this, this patient was referred to me, and obviously, uh, you know, th this is a very tough complication to deal with. Um, you know, either one, the oral antral fistula or the buccal fat pad infection. There, these are both tough, them, tough, tough things to deal with. I mean, this is not something you can close with a buccal fat pad anymore because the buccal fat pad is completely infected. So this patient needs removal, everything, and you have to go back to square one. This is another case that was just referred to me: a patient with an oral antral fistula, and unfortunately, they had attempted to close it with a buccal fat pad four or five times. Um, so I, I basically assumed, I said, well, let me try it one more time with a buccal fat pad. So I went in there and completely mobilized the buccal fat pad to the best of my ability and freed it up and closed it primarily. And I'm hoping this takes and this stays because, um, you know, the buccal fat pad, usually I can mobilize and bring it all the way to the midline. But because this thing was so scarred, there's not much I could do. Now, if this fails, what do I need to do? Then I'm going to have to do um, a, a rotational flap from either the anterior maxilla bring all this over or do a tongue flap and a tongue flap is a hard sell to a patient but you know this patient would refer to me to get this closed and if we can't close it with this then we have to do a tongue flap there's really no other options now this is the worst orbital penetration this is a patient that had zygomatic implants done elsewhere and was referred to me luckily for this patient uh, even though uh, the implants engaged the floor of the orbit the orbit itself um, that is not penetrated. The orbital floor was completely penetrated inadvertently. So um, this patient's almost um, a year out and has had no issues, but some would argue about going in there and taking out the implants just to avoid any future issues because that periorbital fat and muscles 
you can get some shrinkage and then the patient can develop a problem. So we've decided to go back and uh, remove these implants uh, because of, to avoid the risk of future, future complications. So like I said, zygomatic implants are a great service for patients. There's a lot of great things we can do, but you also have to be aware of pitfalls and complications. And um, I think that was it. So this is our future courses um, at the Florida National Dental Congress. Next year, I'm doing a hands-on uh, course uh, the FNDC, it's June of 2021. We were supposed to do another one this April in uh, in Phoenix, Arizona with uh, the Western Regional Dental uh, uh, Evaluation Exam, uh, actually, um, meeting, but that was postponed because of the pandemic. And uh, I think that's going to be rescheduled. Um, and I think with that, that was actually my last slide. I want to thank everyone. And let me see if I can get to some questions now. Um, I know. There's 12 of them. Let me go back here and move this. So the, I know you mentioned the great cell paper threads. So actually, the, that's a great question. Uh, so the implant is, is you can you can place the implant with a handpiece. Um, so basically, uh, great question. So there, you're asking, uh, you're not searching for bicortical fixation. What's the parameter for primary stabilization? So basically, just like any other dental implants, my Ideal torque value is going to be at least 40 to 45 newton centimeters. I do I can place these with uh, a hand driver. So if you um, go back and look at the kit, there are some um, there are there are um, some. Uh, I apologize. Give me one second. Uh, there are some uh, uh, drivers that you can place on your handpiece to place the implants, and you can torque it in. Uh, but I you know I've gained more. Ex uh, experience by using uh, the, uh, the Norris uh, hand driver, uh, but that's how I know. Let's look at the question. Do you use virtual planning to decide the accurate spot for the placement? I don't use the virtual planning, the, the eZygoma. I have not, uh, but I will be using it. I, I actually think it's going to be uh, a, a phenomenal service for patients. I think for a few of my patients that I did not use it for, it was, it was a matter of cost. Um, uh, but I think the virtual planning uh, is a no-brainer. And for for the beginning surgeon, I think the easy uh, plan and the easy IGOMA that Norris offers, uh, it's a no-brainer. If you haven't done these before, I would definitely encourage you to, to use that technology because it's available. Uh, and I, I will be using it for uh, my next course uh, because I want uh, whoever comes here to get the, to get that exposure as well. Uh, if virtual is not available, how to safely place implants avoiding the infratemporal fossa and um, the orbit? Well, so that's a great question. So basically, I plan my surgeries ahead of time using my CT scan, uh, nonetheless. And during surgery, as I, I, I showed you, I take that um, the measuring device, I place it into my osteotomy, and I want to feel the tip of it from outside. So I basically place my finger on the outside, and I make sure I feel the tip, or it hits my refractor. Uh, so if someone has a really fat uh, fat cheek, you're not going to feel that, uh, and but you'll feel it hit the tip of your refractor. So um, I take every, uh, every step uh, along the way to make sure that I don't hit that. I think I answered the next few questions. Uh, let me see here. Uh, where did I train? I trained at the University of Miami. I trained at dental school at University of Florida, and my medical school at University of Miami in oral surgery and my fellowship at the University of Miami. I think I answered, thanks for an elaborate answer. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, do you prepare bone when suturing for flap fixation? So uh, and I, in general, I don't prepare bone when I'm suturing for flap fixation. However, that is perfectly fine to do. Um, and I have um, used a PRF membrane uh, over my buccal fat pad in the past, but the buccal fat pad is th so thick and robust. So you can take a PRP membrane and um, and put it over there. And so someone asked, why do I preserve the midline? As I mentioned, I preserve the midline because I want to make sure I can um, uh, uh, suture that buccal fat pad to the anterior portion of the maxilla. How we remove a nice integrated implant that is too close to the orbit? Oh, so actually, interestingly, um, I've had to remove a couple of of implants that were close to the orbit in the past, and uh, I, you know, you very very cautiously 
um, uh, back that implant out. Now, if you can back that implant out, you either have to, to leave it there or take an infraorbital approach, like I'm treating an orbital floor fracture, and then I'm basically I, pay, I place an orbital uh, floor retractor into the orbit to protect the orbital contents and perform an apicoectomy on that implant because at least four or five millimeters of that implant is in the orbit. So if it doesn't back out, then I basically will do an apicoectomy on that implant as well, keeping in mind that I'm going to protect the orbit with an orbital floor retractor. So I, I actually, it's a very good question, um, so Mr. Dr. Rodriguez. So I have placed zygomatic implants in a patient that have had a total maxillectomy after radiation therapy. And that's the only time that I've had a failure in the last three years. So I had one patient that he, of the four implants I placed, he lost one of those. So it's a risk you have to take. Now, remember, uh, depends on the amount of radi radiation therapy they got because um, maxillary osteoradionecrosis is extremely, extremely rare. Uh, and the only time I've seen maxillary osteoradionecrosis is in a patient that got about 8,000 centigrade of external beam radiation. So it's very, very rare. Um, so where do I train for zygoma and do I use PRF membranes for the sinus? So you know what, here it's a very, very interesting story. Um, I did uh, a, a fellowship with Dr. Robert Marks uh, with tumor reconstructive surgery at the University of Miami. So when I was out in private practice, uh, I was doing a lot of all on fours. And in my very, very first case, that failed miserably because I was using uh, these uh, three eye tapered nano implants that had a high failure rate. I had no choice but to, uh, to learn and teach myself there weren't a lot of docs doing training guys out then. The back then, um, Dr. Tom Ball, she was training docs out in, um, in uh, Pennsylvania. So I called him and he said, listen, if you can do a pectoralis major flap, you can teach yourself to do this or you can come here and have me do it. So I actually taught myself then. And over the years, I have learned a lot. So I think a lot of the docs out there um, have obviously learned it from I've, I've taken some courses with Dr. Edmund Bedrosian, uh, which is a very good friend and a phenomenal surgeon. So if I had taken any formal courses, it was with Dr. Balshi and with Dr. Edmund Bedrosian, which are two of the pioneers in the field of zygomatic surgery. Um, but uh, I, I, I'm pretty much self-taught, but I owe a lot of what I know to them. Um, so reposition the buckle fat pad. I have not seen any unforeseen sort of cosmetic issues whatsoever on these patients. Uh, because remember, the, 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 the buccal fat pad is very robust. It has multiple lobes. I'm just taking the most medial lobe, which is not that vital to the cosmesis, and bringing it over to cover, uh, uh, cover the, uh, the cylinders over the implants. Um, let me see. I, I hope I answered everyone, everyone's questions. Like I said, if I did not, please feel free to send me an email or, or a message. So I said I answered, oh, oh, there's four open questions. What would be the optimum torque? Like I said, the optimum torque is at least 45 Newton centimeters. I, I always get more than that because uh, you're, you're placing this implant into dense D1 bone. Um, there's no way you're, you're going to get minimal uh, torque on these implants. Key is not to over torque it, obviously. Um, I think I answered uh, Dr. Mohammed's question. Thank you. For, for signing in from Iran, I really appreciate it. I know the time difference is very um, uh, uh, vast. I know a lot of people sign in from Iran, India, the Middle East, and I, I appreciate you guys uh, staying tuned for so long. How, uh, okay, kind of this last one, how long after radio ther therapy do you recommend going for a zygomatic? That's a great question, Doc. So with, obviously remember, with radiation therapy, anytime I have a patient that is undergoing radiation, I prefer to place the implant within that first six months um, and uh, before that, you know, that golden window of opportunity. Some people say it's up to a year because remember over the years, the effects of radiation, it's a, it's a gift that keeps on giving. It can actually get worse over time. Mm -hmm. And so I prefer to do my implants very early on before the deleterious effects of radiation kick in. Now, remember people get radiation mucositis, radiation burns in the first 30 days. So I let that go away and then I do my implants afterwards. Now, with zygomatic implants for head and neck cancer cases, um, 
um, I'm, I invite you, you can send me an email and I send you some cases that I've done. Those we do not do immediate loads on just because it's very difficult. They're wearing an operator. Uh, that's the only time I don't recommend doing an immediate load on those cases. However, um, you know, I, I do I do try to do it early on. And I don't, even though it's kind of uh, objectionable to some people, a lot of people still believe in using hyperbaric oxygen therapy for these patients. Um, so I still put them through um, um, uh, through hyperbaric oxygen therapy. So as far as my courses in Arizona, if you have a valid dental license somewhere in the country, um, we can get you a one-week temporary license. And actually, uh, what happens is um, you can, as long as the patient is not paying for the services, uh, your tuition covers their expenses, then you can actually uh, participate and place the actual implants under my supervision on the patients. So it's great. You know, the state of Arizona um, had, uh, somehow had uh, this built into their, their dental board where if you have an active license somewhere in the country, you can get a, um, a one-week license. So it's great. As far as the type of occlusion, the temporary prosthesis, it's, a, it's basically a flat plane uh, 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 occlusion that's determined by the restorative doctor. Um, and, and basically, uh, we remove all interferences and in, in centric from them. And uh, what about malpractice? So actually, that's that, that's a good question. Your own malpractice company will cover that um, uh, for for these patients, um, for um, for any patients that you treat during that week. So basically, you just tell. I mean, it's like anything else. If you're uh, some people have licenses to practice in multiple states, and what happens with them? is um, they, you know, they should cover you. Because when I, when I do my courses, uh, I go to Florida and I do live surgery there and I work on patients. My own malpractice company covers, uh, covers my, uh, my malpractice. So um, I think um, you, you should be covered. And I think uh, Dr. Villarreal, yeah, I, I, I think I, I answered that question, but I think, uh, are there any, I, hopefully I didn't leave anyone uh, unanswered, and I do. If I did, I apologize. Uh, to what you already knew that. I think you saw the surgical steps. And like I said, uh, if anyone has any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. I, with that, I, th I thank everyone. I think we had a, a great audience. They're trying to put in the code, but there's no option to put it in. I think if you have any questions, I would uh, encourage you to call um, Norris Medical for your or continuing education certificate. I think that's what the question was. Um, I thank you, everyone, and I, I hope I, um, I added something to your afternoon. I appreciate your patience, and thank you for your, uh, being a great audience. Uh, let me see. There's chat here. More questions. There are more questions. Or that was what I already answered. Oh, yeah, I did.